Hello, everybody, and welcome to TNM Coaching Unplugged and Zoran Todorovic Interconnected Podcast. The space where you elevate your heart, your minds, you expand your soul to the next level and beyond. The space when you get inspired to think about yourself differently, to adapt to the new world that we're facing right now, and to really learn from these powerful teachers that we're bringing week after week to your attention, to your knowledge. And today I have a very good friend, collaborator, Nick. Uh, is joining, joining us today. Let me tell you a few things about Nick, and then he's also going to share a bit about himself as well. He's an amazing coach, absolutely fantastic transformational leader. He is a fantastic keynote speaker. He has more than 25 years of experience in advising Fortune 500 companies. Um, he's also a CEO of Switch On Platform, which is a wonderful platform full of resources for individuals, for leaders, for coaches. He is a one of these futurist thought leader, he's offering transformational leadership programs, teamwork programs, innovation services. He has delivered more than 1,000 keynote speeches to organizations like Google, Nike, Microsoft. And he has also developed more than 100,000 leaders in organizations like Unilever, Intel, Novartis, and so on and so forth. His specialty is coaching as well, and this is what I love about Nick. And today we're going to just play and explore this uh, topic of wise leaders and why it's important nowadays to bring wisdom into leadership. What what does it mean for all of us and how can we capitalize on our wisdom in our everyday life as leaders, as coaches, and so on and so forth. Nick, welcome to the call. Welcome to this podcast. I'm so grateful and happy to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you. I always get a bit kind of uh, awkward hearing about what I've done, Um, but I am owning it. I'm owning my power uh, in today's uh, session. So, yeah, thank you. Lovely to be here. It's been, yeah, we've met years ago now, I think, a a long time ago now, like maybe even a decade ago. So it's lovely to be still in touch and uh, see your flowering and your work. And, and, yeah, super lovely. Exactly. And also, you know, I love seeing your flowering, your work. You keep on always being at the edge. You know, what I love about you is that, when I need inspiration myself and when I need to see what's going on, what is the next frontier? What do we need to focus on? Yeah, I always go to your social media, to your website, and I always get inspired. And I hope that our audience is going to be inspired as well with you today. And what we were talking about in our Instagram live, you know, just a few days ago is this concept of wisdom in leadership and why is it so important to have this wise leadership present in our lives right now. So, and you also shared with me that this is something that you're exploring right now, that you're you know, diving into at this moment in time, you're expanding and you're really getting your head around this topic. So I think this is a wonderful topic, especially for our business audience, because we're all challenged nowadays to become more wise. So let's dive into it. Where are you in relationship with this topic? What has been happening in your research, in your in your processes, so we can unfold this conversation in that direction? Great. I mean, it's huge and it's and it's real and it's right now for me. Yeah, it's definitely alive in me. So uh, what's the good way in? So let me maybe go like outside in in first. Um, and in fact, I've just been um, speaking with someone who, a collaborator in my um, sustainability business that is our, our my sister business to switch on, is it's called Future Makers. And I was just um, actually interviewing the CEO, uh, Kat, and um, just talking about, you know, the CEOs of the world, the, the SVPs, the entrepreneurs, whether it's a small business like ours or, or mega business, doesn't matter. We've got so many things to do. We've got inflation and economic sort of, um, you know, slowness, basically. No one's loving the economy right now. But we've also got this reality they don't even want the economy to grow because if the economy grows, carbon grows. Um, and if the economy grows, inequality often grows um, and pollinator loss and biodiversity loss. So we've got real world economic problems. We've got real world social environmental problems. Then we've got our own personal issues, burnout, post-pandemic, exhaustion, overwhelm. I don't know a single leader we work with who doesn't feel overwhelmed. We've been told to grow short-term profit and long-term viability. And we've got to innovate because we know our business models aren't going to work in 10 years from now. So this is just the, like, the, the thing we've got to deal with as leaders. And what I think, or what we offer currently is what we would call transformational leadership or adaptive leadership, which encompasses all these things. You know, how do you change the world, change your organization from the outside in, 
you know, AI, technology, climate change, and the inside out. And yet, the more I think about it, the more transformation leadership is a perfectly great term, but it's still hooked into a kind of Western, quite masculine idea of I'm going to transform everything myself. Um, and often we learn with wisdom that leadership is about giving people and systems, actually, the, the space and the, um, the support to unfold and grow without less of the doing the transformation and more allowing transformation to occur. And so for me, wise leadership is a kind of more feminine way of describing what is often a very masculine, creative, transformational, adaptive. Same, same. But for me, when I say the words, I am interested in wise leadership, it just feels in my body different from transformation leadership. They, they cover a similar ground, obviously part of the same thing. But for me, it opens something. And, and I have learned with my own wisdom to follow what opens, follow where aliveness, what we might call eros, follow where, where the aliveness is, is moving. So it's not something new per se, but it's quite new for me. And I think the framing of it opens something up for me. And when I was preparing for this conversation, I was explaining to my business partner, Alison, uh, the leadership in the leadership side of things, what I was going to talk about. And how it links to something I saw this week on LinkedIn, actually. So I, I will reference something very specific. So a friend of mine had uh, a long-awaited audience with the Dalai Lama um, a couple of weeks ago and posted on LinkedIn that they'd prepared a, a question for him. Um, there's a bunch of smart cookies. They all studied at the Harvard uh, Kennedy School of Public Leadership. You know, So there's up-and-coming, young, potentially wise leaders, I guess, hope. And he basically you know, said something along the lines, of, I didn't see the whole video, but, you know, what about the pain of the world? What about Afghanistan, the Taliban, women, the, the suffering, the real gnarly stuff, right? Um, and he felt that the answer was a bit um, kind of monodimensional, mono, kind of, well, we're all connected, we're all one, it will all be okay kind of thing, which is a totally understandable sentence because at the greatest level of abstraction, into the big world of the absolute oneness that we might all feel some time to time. And that is the case, you know, things come and things go and yet galaxies die and galaxies grow. That rhymes, might have to be my next poem. Yeah, um, it's good. <laughs> it's really good. It's a Poetry. Um, and then yeah, I was reflecting, and I wrote something on the post that I've long worked, reflected on um, around Gandhi's letter to Hitler saying, you know, nonviolence and will you please change your what you're doing, because, you know, we, we think better, there's better things you can be doing. And it just doesn't work. That kind of nonviolent, what we might call spiritual leadership, doesn't really work with people who are totalizing, um, sociopathic, um, narcissistic, um, violent, um, something else is needed. So that got me thinking, well, a lot of the Eastern traditions of wisdom kind of avoided politics because the emperor was the emperor, and mm -hmm. that hadn't changed for 500 years. So if you were a Taoist or a Zen patriarch or um, a Vedantan scholar, the focus was always the inside. Actually, there's a great um, scholar, David Loy, who's written about this. You know, the, the generation of Eastern wisdom traditions came from a much more focused on, we can't change out there, let's focus on in here. Exactly. And then you, you look at the Western tradition, of leadership, kind of Greek, heroic, Ulysses, mm -hmm. take it all on yourself, that kind of alpha, I am transforming my country to be better, which is great as well, mm -hmm. but not so much focus on the inside, um, although there's a great book that I reference in, in my book, Spiritual Atheist, um, uh, academic called um, Pierre Hadot, a French academic, who basically said all the early Greek writings were basically spiritual practices. Um, uh, a book's called Philosophy as a Way of Life, uh, about the sort of everyday internal work of Greek thinking. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so you've got these two strands coming to us. We've got this very much focused on the world, the outer game, you might call it. Um, the tr we're going to go and deal with the Trojans because they stole our lady. It's about as heroic masculine as you can get, right? And then you've got this other strand of Eastern philosophy and leadership where the Taoist is the advisor to the emperor and speaks mm -hmm. in a very poetic 
you know, maybe we'll solve the problem. Maybe we'll just have a long game and the problem will solve itself, you know, whatever. And I think for me, one way of lensing wise leadership is the best of both. Um, mm-hmm. So we've got another, you know, we're saying that's the best of the masculine, of the alpha, of the line, of the, we're going to solve some stuff. There's problems. We don't like them. They're causing suffering. They're causing pain. We need to solve them. And it could be climate change. It could be low economic growth. It could be we need to transmit to uh, transform to a digital business model, or we've got to use AI, whatever. That's the kind of one strand. And then you've got this other strand, this more feminine, reflective strand of deep listening, listening to others, uh, listening to self, reciprocity, um, that kind of um, being in communion with nature. What, you know, Martin Buber's idea of the I, thou, we're in relationship. And if you bring the two together, I guess what you get is what I would call wise leadership. Um, there's a term, regenerative leadership, which I like to, but it gets people a bit caught up in, well, what does that mean? And one of the things I love about the word wisdom, since I got into wisdom tradition, the wisdom traditions, is everyone kind of knows what it means, even though no one can describe it. It's one of those weird words that you could spend 12 hours writing 500 different de- de- variants. But we all know what it is, and we all know what it feels like, and we all know when someone's got it, more mm-hmm. or less. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's really interesting that we've got this sort of knowing, this yeah. precognitive knowing of what wisdom is without really... I mean, know when we feel it in ourselves, right? We're like, insight, ah... I need to ask how they're doing before I try and sell them my product. Genius idea, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. We're like, wisdom. Um, so, yeah, there's something for me there about um, bringing the best of this outer game, outside in, solve the problems, deal with the stuff, because it does need to be solved. You know, one of the things that I always test my own ideas and teachings against is the Holocaust, which my grandfather's family perished and he was the only one to get out of berlin 1939 kind of thing does what i say and teach help with that and Mm -hmm. part of that is how do you not get killed and not let someone like a hitler or a totalizing sociopath take over a business or a, a political place and then the other part of that is how do i become at peace with what is um and um two together are good right we've got it uh, solve and we've got to be at peace with not solving um mm. which can be summarized in my first book switch on by this simple phrase from improvisation theory yes and you know super simple yes mm-hmm. that's what's happening i accept it i acknowledge it i do not need to change it it's perfect as it is and children being abused by their parents is not actually perfect it's perfect on the absolute level of what is and it's not perfect um, so I'm going to move to uh, attempt to heal it or be- create more wholeness in it. And I think for me, wise leadership is about masculine and feminine, line, circle, um, heroic, Taoist, for one of a better time. You know, just bringing it all together uh, in ourselves, in one body and one mind at the same time. And and how would you you know approach it with leaders who are listening to this and, and and they're fascinated by the whole concept and they're like yes you know yes yes I I hear I understand mm-hmm. and and I would love to become wise leader I would love to create this integration between masculine and feminine because what you're saying is that that wisdom comes from that integration when we bring both Thanks dimension so. into one and then we use both it's not either or. So what is the pathway of activation for a leader who is open and willing to adapt and to activate their inner wisdom Mm. and integrate those two elements inside of themselves? What would you say is the journey Mm. that one needs to go through in order to be able to arrive to that point? I'll have to go live it myself and come back in 20 years and tell you. Um, That's the real answer. But no, I I have... But, just you know, let's anticipate. Let's just... Think different, exactly. What can, what can be? What can be a journey? I think there's a couple of things that came as you said that. Um, one is... Um, it's long. Uh, and I think that's something that our clients struggle with. Um, so um, 
at most a program that we run on on wise leadership transformation ship is 18 months maybe two years max Mm-hmm. And within that, there may only be six or seven days of time. Plus, we give them tools and practices and toolkits and things they can do on their own and circles. So we're trying to maximize develop, let's call it developmental time. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I'm absolutely clear on is development to a next stage of evolution. Uh, uh, let's call it a developmental stage. Takes mm-hmm. years, not months, often multiple years, potentially even a decade. All right. And there are ways to amplify it and accelerate it. And I'll come back to that in a second. But there's a patience that's needed that we have to live through our experiences. Rilke said it brilliantly, you know, don't ask for the questions because you're not ready for the questions. You know, live, uh, uh, so don't ask for the answers. You're not ready for the answers. Live the questions now is the famous phrase. It's beautiful. So maybe step one is to live the questions in you. What is it in your world that is struggle, is painful in your inner world, your personal life, your relationship life? Because we're not, we're a leader in every, we're a leader, leadership doesn't start and stop at 9.01 when we enter the office or when we turn off Slack, as we just talked about. It's all the time. I'm leading my kids. I'm leading my wife. I'm leading myself. I'm leading, um, I'm being led by my wife, just so everyone's clear. I'm, I'm not in a Of course. Me too. <laughs> exactly. I think it's my grandma said to It's called surrendered leadership. It's, called, it's a different thing. Exactly. I think that my grandma said to me, the man leads, the woman guides, or something yeah, like that. That's it, know, that's it, exactly. Like that. <laughs> uh, or as the English say, happy wife, happy life. Yes. Um, it, so uh, we're all leaders. We're leaders at every moment, right? If you're, as I have recently g- gone through an absolutely heart-renderingly difficult grief experience, um, that is material. That is the thing that I have to deal with as a leader. That's my um metabolistic fuel um so i look talk a lot about metabolism i was a medic so i use a lot of biological terminology so just as we metabolize food into atp or energy um amino acids we metabolize experience into value if you're an organization to innovation and as an individual into wisdom into life skills into capacity right mm-hmm. so maybe the first thing is live where you are and live your questions. That would be, I think, a great start point for everyone. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, uh, and the first one is patience. Development takes time. Um, one of the things I often say is, if, you know, you open a rose in February uh, of January in England. That rose is not beautiful. It's just a gooey mess of green stickiness. Uh, mm-hmm. Wait four months, and it's a spectacular thing that, smells and you know and you have to wait you just have to be patient it takes time um yes i can give it nutrients and manure and blah blah and water it and protect it i don't do that with my roses but you know people do um and so i can nurture myself i can give myself time off i can um listen to podcasts i can read i can follow actually i'll come back to that synchronicities because i think that's a big piece um but I, I can nurture myself, but the time of development is the time of development. That's the first one. Second one, live where you're at, live your questions. Third, use your fuel um, for metabolism, for wisdom. Don't use someone else's because it's their life, you know, not your life. And that's three important things. I think there's another piece without which I'm sure there are lots of accidentally wise people who have not gone on a deep path of of a spirit we, i don't like the word spiritual i have no idea what it means anymore but some kind of inner exploration of who i am in relationship to the universe uh, as a whole mm-hmm. i don't know many and i think at some point you've got to go and who am i um how do i relate to nature how do i relate to the cosmos and for me that doesn't have to be some big i don't have to drop out and go to live in an ashram you know you can do that in a very degenerative way you can go do it in the woods by your house you can do it um, in Peru in, with the sh- shaman, you can do it in coaching, you can do it in meditation. There are a hundred routes. Um, and I recommend them all at some point, I guess, try them all. But I think without some answering the question, who am I in relationship to the whole? The roots of wisdom can't tap deep into the soil and they don't have that much to hang on. Mm-hmm. But once you've done some of that questioning, um, and in my one of my books, I say, you know, it's you've got to come out the closet. The last taboo is coming out the spiritual closet. 
as a leader um by talking about things like shock horror love um compassion yeah. Yeah. Care, relationships yeah and thankfully the world is moving rapidly towards that anyway so yeah, we're all right. basically a bit spiritual now um and it's okay that mm. said i don't roll into a workshop um with my incense burning um and some clothes i may not wear during a workshop i you know, i i i I, I'm in a conversation between what is appropriate in the business environment, not just clothes, words, everything. Languaging is so important for what the work we do. Mm. Um, so, for example, rather than saying, what does your inner shaman say to a client? I might say, what does we call it creating connect mode say? Mm. Um, if I'm doing a therapeutic coaching, I say, what does the connector in you say mm. or want? So this nuancing is important. Um, this finding commonality, finding common ground. Um, and then I'm also a big believer, uh, particularly when coaching, in appreciating what already has come. And we've all been through gnarly moments. We all have wisdom already. So let's maybe start with that. Like, what have I already learned through the gnarly, humbling, stumbling of my life that I would teach my children, or I do teach my children, or I teach the younger version of me? Um, that's a great start point for wisdom is appreciating the we're using the metaphor, I keep going back to the rose. Let's appreciate the seed and the shoot of mm -hmm. wisdom or the shoots that are already in me mm -hmm. and try not to be like some kind of Taoist, you know, Zen Ren, perfect man quite yet, you know, because I may or may not live into that, who knows? Um, but right now I'm doing the best I can, ch churning and, you know, eating my my wisdom food which mm -hmm. often doesn't look very nice when mm -hmm. you first look at it right it's not usually like a michelin three star sushi meal it usually looks more like a piece of poo <laughs> um, and then you're like well that's the poo i've been given so and then i use it to catalyze my wisdom right exactly and it's manure you're like oh that's a, that's something really important there because manure, exactly exactly the, the, i do a lot of work in this regenerative sustainable space which is looking at nature and going, why is it so thriving and we don't seem to do so well emotionally, depression, anxiety, um, inequality, whatever. And actually one of the great lessons from nature is what is someone else's um, poo is your food, right? Um, I wrote in, I think, one of my books, you know, everything's pers perspective. My death is a horror for me, but for the worms, it's a big old party. So... Yeah. Who is who is manure? I mean, that's that's the end of the podcast. Who is manure? And then we walk off. Um, but no, it's something really important there. There is something really important there. Is that um, you know that is yeah. wisdom. You know, you know, the, you, you, of all people know the 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 metaphor of the lotus of enlightenment. You know, the lotus blossom is this beautiful thing um, that resonates with spiritual integrity and and radiance. And it comes from the mucky, dirty, stinky mud. And I, when I travel around Vietnam and China, I mean, it really is stinky mud a lot of the time that the, these flowers are growing in. It's not, it's fetid, you know. And I think in the West, we, like, we don't like fetidness, right? We're trying to clean everything all the time and make everything beautiful, like a TV show, Home and Garden. Yeah. Um, and life is fetid a lot of the time. And I think that's where some of the wisdom comes yeah. from. And I love what you're saying that from that space, the way the wisdom comes, because a lot of us, we would love to do bypassing. We would like to move away from discomfort. We would love to, you know, avoid the powerful lessons that life has given us to actually invite us or to, to be in relationship with our wisdom. We want to move away from this. We don't like this discomfort. And I think that beautiful thing that you're sharing right now, that, that substance of catalyzing your wisdom is actually being able to be present to that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, if to speaking between us and everyone's listening, um, as I, so I wrote a, a kind of philosophical autobiography called Spiritual Atheist, which was about my journey to reconcile my scientific upbringing, my atheistic scientific, quite Marxist, kind of change the world, don't talk about it, do stuff, writing amnesty letters to prisoners, and you know, when I was ten with my dad, you know that life and then i had this wisdom 
awakening opening where i got deep into this uh, who am i kind of you know i am that kind of question um and in it i'm very clear that i found what we could call new age culture mm -hmm. not all spirituality just particularly this one type of culture i've always found it quite challenging um now part of that is i'm a design snob and i find some of the aesthetics just not very pretty not very nice the icon my wife and I, who's Californian, we talk about new age font uh, in a lot of like flyers. And I'm like, there's a lots of other fonts, guys, and they, they're great. Um, so I, I tongue in cheek, but I, the bit I've always found wrong, actually, I guess. Um, and I say that without wanting to make anybody wrong is the attempt to come away from the cycles of life, the seasons of life. And escape into what another collaborator of mine, uh, Adriana, calls a perpetual summer, mm -hmm. which is okay. I'm going to fly to Goa because it's too cold in England, and I'm going to go to um, you know Ibiza for a season, and then we're going to go to um, I don't know Sao pa Rio. I'm just going to avoid winter, and I mean that in all the senses of winter. You know, winter is coming, as we know, um, yeah. and yet when I'm walk and I love the sun. And I'm actually about to move myself, I think, to a more sunny place. So I'm not saying that's not a, a very viable life choice. And spending 10 years in rural England in the mud, which I was in earlier as I prepared for this with my dog. It's so muddy, I can't even tell you. Freezing. My hands were freezing. It's like minus two. There is something so profound about accepting the winter of our season, of our life, of our cycle of learning, this particular cycle of our death. Winter is essential because without it, we can't have and enjoy and appreciate the summer. And I think that's something that I've really learned. Um, I've been talking about as seasonal leadership or rhythmical leadership, mm -hmm. um, just a piece of the puzzle, right, of wisdom. And that means, like, if I'm not feeling this week that I can be alpha hero guy, then, okay, I'm going to be tending to myself guy. If I am feeling like our company needs to die, kill a product, painful though it may be then that's also part of the wisdom is letting go of the things that aren't working and and the mulching of nature is so good at that it, it just kills oh it it disintegrates what doesn't what is not working yeah um and so yeah so that's the the part of spirituality that i've always struggled with is this um what do we call it there's like an ascent away from death mm. and decay and and darkness and pain and loss uh, and i think if you want to be wise you have to embrace that part of the essential nature of life as much as you know the sun and the sunsets on um you know and beautiful instagram posts and, and you beautiful know instagram posts and amazing social media and then, and as, I, as i wrote one somewhere it's much easier to feel enlightened um on a terrace uh, in Ibiza with the beautiful house music pumping and everyone's like, whoo, whoo. And I, that's one of my best moments, right? I'm not, you know, or in Goa at Christmas and everyone's whoo, whoo. I love those moments. And it's also been the teaching of the solitude and the, the coldness that has probably given me more. The, the, the whoop whoop gave me a gateway to what can be felt in any moment, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, and the communion of togetherness. And it's important to have those moments to remember what it's like to be in communion, ecstatic, celebratory. Because in those cold moments, you need that. <laughs> you need to remember. Exactly. You need to call it forward. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You need to bring it. What's the word I think people use a lot? You need to evoke it within yourself, right? Mm -hmm. So we explored a lot around how to get there and, 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 you know, what wisdom really brings. So when we have this union between masculine and feminine, and we really step into the wise, the wise self, I know that you are scientific as well as evolutionary. I'm not going to use spiritual <laughs> because that's the word that you don't like. So evolutionary, transformational, scientific, but in your own life journey, where does the wisdom come from? So what is the part of you that you connect to mm, 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 to mm. bring that seed forward to bring that flower that rose that shoot that you described but where is that Ooh. okay i'll try and tackle this from a couple of lenses i think the most important thing is i really care 
Mm-hmm. I've always cared, probably too much. That's part of my journey has been to care a little less, to be less codependent and what I would call enmeshed in caring, mm-hmm. to pull away a bit. Some people are so far away, they need to come in more. Um, what we call innies and outies, you know, there's no right or wrong. Everyone's one of them. Um, I really care. I care about learning. I care about myself. I care about my family. I care about the world. Deeply care. I have a big, juicy heart. Um, and I think a lot of wisdom comes from caring, ultimately. Um, and I know also that not caring is usually a protective mechanism and adaptive response to disappointment and um, hurt. And so maybe part of the journey of wisdom is to care again at the beginning. You know, um, Caring is super important. But then if like we spin that around and have a look at more of a scientific, rational view, um, I think there, there are ways to really consciously integrate these two great strands of human being, the scientific, the masculine, the rational, analytical, with the feminine, the intuitive, the, the embodied, the ecstatic. Um, and I think you can be quite purposeful about it. Um, and I, def- I definitely have. You know, I've gone through very scientific phases and I go through very intuitive phases. And when I'm writing, and when we, my wife and I have been developing a theory of transformation of change called biotransformation, about 10 years now of work. And we are explicitly bringing the scientific rational, all the case studies, the scientific papers, with all this wisdom, we're, we're sort of joining dots. Um, and while we do it, we're doing it ourselves, right? We're going, well, what do we feel? And what do we intuit about this topic? Uh, I know, psychological safety in the workplace. What does the science say? What do we feel about it? What do we learn through experience? And then let's bring it all together into the best thing we can. Um, mm-hmm. And that's actually got me to developing what, uh, so th- th- until last year, there were seven main principles of biotransformation. Mm-hmm. Um, and we've developed an eighth. Uh, and there are many, many more, I don't know, but eight, eight is how what we've got right now. And the eighth one is about the eight eyes of, of, of wisdom, I guess, of, of sense-making and decision-making to make it more, Mm -hmm. easy um and one set of the eyes the four of the eyes are let's call them rational analytic intellectual masculine heroic blah 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 and four of the eyes are thankfully you know in balance feminine intuitive creative mystical you know so one is like material world one is the conscious world and so i've definitely seen that these are two strands always in they complement. They're always they're actually one. So on the spiritual atheist covers a Mobius strip, and one of the things, and I'll just do one now. One of the things I said to my son actually two days ago, I said, "What you know? Have a look at this picture of a Mobius strip." And he goes, "I said, what do you think of it?" So I made him one, and I'll make you one now for anyone's watching this. If you're not listening, the Mobius strip is a piece of paper, mm-hmm. clearly only one piece of paper, mm-hmm. uh, one hole, one one universe. Yeah. But if you put it together like this, suddenly you've got two sides clearly two sides, but only one. You could just keep going around and it just... Yeah. And so for me, this is a kind of symbol of the conundrum of masculine, feminine, rational, spiritual, whatever you want to call these opposing yin-yang forces. They're only one thing, but they're actually two things. So a uh, posh term I use is um, dual aspect, non-duality, just if you're philosophically minded. Uh, it's only one thing, but there's two aspects at all times. And so I think it's important to consciously develop the two. And I'm going to show you where that really lands um, is what I experienced in the pandemic, right? Um, so I watched my Facebook feed fill up with people who let's call them evolutionary because that's the word we're using today. I like it, actually. I think I, I actually I like it because it's actually both science and um, yeah. consciousness. Yeah. 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 So anyway, let's, let's, use, let's use the S word. So there's scientific people posting what's going on, theories. Papers about COVID, SARS, blah, blah, and immunizations. And then there are spiritual people going, oh, no, it's all because someone over here did this, or there's a plot over here, or anti-vaccine. And even within the spiritual feed of mine, who I know people who are committed, I'm talking about they teach, live, and earn, which is a really important livelihood through wisdom as a concept, that world schismed into a kind of left wing and right wing. We thought we were all just one great sort of group. And actually, no, it's, and it's been quite hardcore. I've noticed that people are, who won't really speak to me anymore. And there are people who, you know, who I'm not sure I, I want to hang out with that much because their views are so extreme. Mm-hmm. And so for me, I'm always trying as a leader and a leader of leaders and a teacher and a person who just 
influences. What does the science say? What's my intuitive sense of whether I'm going to take a vaccine or whether my son should or whether I'm going to use a mask or whatever? And trying to bring them to, to always together, always in the moment. And that, whether it's four eyes or eight eyes or whatever, doesn't really matter um, the detail. We're always bringing these two strands together in ourselves for both sense making, what's going on in myself, in the world, and then what do I have to change? Which is really leadership is sense making, decision making. It's super simple in some ways. We call yeah. this a, a transformational leadership loop or wise leadership loop. And I'm actually developing a little icon of it uh, if we're. Or a, a, a project but i think that's the key consciously choosing the intellectual rational scientific bringing that in consciously bringing in the intuitive meditative mindful um relational and making our decisions from the two the two streams and that brings us to the end of this podcast. I mean, 20 minutes just flies, 40 minutes just flies. <laughs> a second when you're with somebody so invigorating and so excited and so wonderful like Nick. Nick, thank you so much for your energy. I mean, yeah, I, what I love, you know, in our exchange and talking to is the amount of beauty and the energy that you invest in, in, in your words and, and everything that you explain. I've learned so much. I thank hope you. our audience learned so much in listening to you. And uh, we're going to of course, uh, reference all your social medias and your websites for people to explore and find you. And thank you so much for uh, being with us today. Any last words of wisdom? And how would you like to leave the audience with anything that you would like to share what comes naturally to you uh, to leave the audience with? Yeah, I just, I, I've never said this before, but I heard myself say earlier, um, start where you are now with your manure and your field of and your grass and your seeds um yeah that's really reassured me as well actually for my own life you know be where you are and take what you've been given and work it and work it uh and find what happens when you transmute it yeah exactly and that's a beautiful beautiful piece of wisdom i'm going to remember that bookmark this thank you so much everybody for tuning in to tnm unplugs around the door which interconnected we love you thank you so much for listening and liking and coming to this podcast week after week Stay well, stay good. Lots of love, everybody. Bye for now, Nick. Thank you so much.